this is another episode, another um, Fox G1 Parent Support Group webinar series um, to that, that Kate Lane, who um, leads our Fox G1 Parent Support Group, has kicked off this webinar series and um, the Parent Support Group Zoom series. Her um, programming has been wonderful. There's just a great um, resource for parents to come together for the Zooms um, where everyone comes together and connects and talks about different topics. Um, so please make sure you are either in the Fox G1 Parents Connect Facebook group um, or that you're getting our emails. If you're not getting our emails, um, reach out to us, contact at fox1research.org to make sure that we can add you or it's also on the newly diagnosed page on foxy1research.org. Um, so we do these Zooms monthly and the webinars are um, a little different than the Zooms where uh, we have some great information to share with you. So I'm gonna turn it over to the great Kate Lane to talk about today's webinar. Well, welcome everybody. Um, thanks for coming to our November Fox G1 Parent Support Group webinar series and I'm a part of a group of volunteers at the Fox G1 Research Foundation that are part of the Fox G1 parent support team and we our goal is looking for ways to support our families more and this is one way that we do it with these webinars and monthly support groups in the summer we had mental health support groups and then earlier this fall we had one with the TELUS Abbey system so today's is the topic is on navigating hospitalizations and it is featuring our lovely three Fox G1 parents um, the first will be Heather Norwood um, who's an experienced parent of an adult son with Fox G1 her son Jacob and then the second presenter will be uh, Dr. Courtney Horton, who works at the Children's, who is a physician at the Children's Medical Center and also Fox G1 mom of Gianna. And then our third presenter will be Kayla Lyman, a certified personal trainer of Helix Fitness for Caregivers and also Fox G1 mom of Phineas. So um, to fit all three of these lovely presenters, let's go ahead and begin with Heather, um, Heather Norwood. Hello there. Um, yes, I'm Heather. I am parent to Jacob, who is amazingly enough 19 years old. I'm still in the process of making the switch from <laughs> saying that I have a child to saying I have an adult uh, child. So it's been interesting. So Jacob has been probably through my best guess right now would be about 25 hospitalizations in his lifetime. The most recent one has probably been a year and a half, which is a minor miracle. Um, so I put together some slides to kind of give you an idea on what I personally have found to be the best process for preparing for a hospitalization. Um, the what I refer to as my holy grail is Jacob's med list. Um, I've taken this right from his own med list and made it generic so that it can be applied to anyone who wants to use it. Uh, I, of course, start out with his name, his date of birth, and I personally like to put the date of the most recent update on there, and that way I know um, whether or not it's current, whether I have to make any changes to it, and we have pharmacy diagnoses, allergies, and I've broken this up into a couple of different ways. So it's a little repetitive in places, but I found for the doctors, it works best. So what I've done here is I've started a daily med list and I've put down how I personally list a liquid med, a tablet med, a nebulizer med, and also if you have prescription formula, and this here is actually Jacob's formula recipe. So you can get an idea um, of what that 
could look like. We mix ours a little differently. We do it up in about 24 hour batches, but when we're hospitalized, the nutritionist is able to take this recipe and break it down into what they need. Um, if you go on to the next slide, my next section is as needed meds. Um, doctors, specialists, medical staff, this is great because I have asked um, the attendings to do consults with his various specialists when he's been in-house, particularly when we get to some sticky situations and we're not in the same hospital system as his specialists. And that way I can just say, call this person, the numbers on the sheet I gave you. I personally also like to list DMEs because that's part of discharge planning is if you need anything, and they're always gonna ask you, um, where do you get this kind of supply or that kind of supply? And rather than try and remember it, it's right there. I like to break down hospitalizations and surgeries into separate categories. What you end up doing is um, perfectly fine if you decide to do something like this. Um, I start with the admit date, the discharge date, the reason for the admission, and then the location. That way I know which system it was in if I ever need to request med recs. I have a tendency to also note if things didn't work or if something did work or you know that we tried three different seizure medis uh, emergency seizure medications before going to an anesthetic to knock this particular seizure out so that again if we end up in a different medical system I have that information and can let them know. Um, and the next slide is what we call in my house again our daily bible for Jacob. We have a 24 hour grid of what his schedule looks like. I color coded the G tube meds and then color coded the red J tube flushes so that people can visually see what's being given via what port. Um, I will also spell right out on here what his nebulizer meds are in what order he gets them. Um, and honestly, when we are admitted, this particular daily grid, and this is where some of the duplication in this is, has been the one thing that every single nurse I've come across appreciates because it lays it all out. Instead of sitting there and having to do med reconciliation with the nurse, they can take this grid, they can go to their computer and plug it in. When it's all plugged in, they'll come back to you and just double check to make sure they got it right. And it's all said and done. Um, I also like this because I've run into issues um, personally with his GJ getting clogged because nurses have decided that they're going to put all of the crushed pills in one 60cc syringe, which without fail will clog it. And I can note this on here so that they can see it in case I forget, which has happened, to mention it to them. Um, in the next slide, is our go bag. We have a go bag. It makes life significantly easier. And I have things that I just keep in it so that I don't have to worry about missing something. Um, it's pretty self-explanatory what's here. The only thing that I pack last minute is usually my prescription meds. Um, my CPAP, which I personally bring because I can't sleep without it, and uh, any electronics that I happen to have. I do have chargers in the go bag, a separate set, because I don't want to have to worry about packing them. Um, now for your child, again, it's a little bit different. You can't necessarily pack ahead of time, but... These are things that I have found to be helpful to grab last minute if I have time, usually while the ambulance is coming. Um, I have found that most hospital systems do not have all of the medications that your child is on. They will say they will, 
even if you have a prior planned surgery that you're going in for, they will assure you that they have everything and you get there and they don't. So I always pack all of the medications just to be on the safe side. I pack formula because they don't always have it. And in one hospital system we use, they only do formula prep once a day. So if we miss that window, I have formula that can be prepped right there on the floor. So if we're starting feeds again, it's available. Um, again, G or J tube extensions are something that I bring because not every hospital system has the same products that you have. Specific products for skin, we have one particular tape that Jacob can use on his skin. Um, everything else he reacts to, so we bring that. Um, small little things like making sure we have his VNS magnet because, again, hospitals don't have them. And you are allowed to bring, like Jacob has a, a BiPAP, you're allowed to bring their own personal mask because the ones that they have there are disposable and not as comfortable. Same with an airway clearance vest. If you use one of those, you can bring it, which is great. Again, makes them more comfortable. So um, I wanted to give you in parents' perspective on what it's like to be in the hospital and what I have found helpful. And I tapped a couple other parents who were frequent flyers to kind of compile a list on what we felt was beneficial. Um, the first is social work. Whenever I get anywhere, um, any hospital system, that is one of the first things I ask for because they can give you all of the information, whether or not the facility has a parking program to help defray the cost of parking, whether or not parent meals are paid or not paid for, uh, food vouchers if they're not paid for. Uh, you would be very surprised at the amount of grants or funds that I have found available. There's one fund that we found that if you're in the hospital for more than seven days, then they'll pay your mortgage or rent for a month. I've found that they will give you gift cards for uh, groceries or food or gas to get back and forth. But again, unless you ask, they won't tell you. Now, the nurse. Nurses are amazing people. They are going to be your access to everything. They know the ins and outs. They know how to advocate you for you, what it is that you need, how to present something to the doctor. So they are going to be your best friend. They are going to be your gatekeeper to the outside world. They're going to be able to tell you where you can go for certain things. They're going to be your advocate and your support system. If, for example, you're not ready for discharge and the attendings and residents are talking about it, tell the nurse that you're not ready for discharge. That person can advocate for you. They can explain to them why you're not comfortable going home, which talk to a, actually happened to a, a Fox G1 mom friend of mine recently. They were trying to get her out three or four days too early and she spoke up to the nurse who spoke up for her. They are going to be your support system for everything. I can't tell you how many nurses' shoulders I have cried on over the years. They are truly remarkable people. They will do your training pre-discharge. If you have gone in and you've got, uh, either you've had a surgery and you need to know wound care, or if you've had like a GJ placement and you need to know how to handle that, they're going to be your end all and be all for that. And they don't mind the questions, so hit them up. They're gonna let you know what therapies are available in the hospital, because a lot of times you can't get OTP to your speech unless you actually ask for it, or an evaluation unless you ask for it, because it's not always in the doctor's wheelhouse. And of course, they're the keeper of snacks, which is kind of important when you forgot to bring your own snacks. So hit them up for anything. Um, 
there's a ton of stuff available also in the hospital to do for fun. One parent I was talking to said they just went out of the room and started wandering the hallway. Take a look around and see what's available. And that's how they found Child Life, who's in charge of all kinds of entertainment for your kids. Uh, toys, games, movies, crafts. I mean, it's it's unbelievable what they can offer for daily activities, therapeutic services, um, music therapy, art therapy. Really, there's some wonderful programs there. Uh, and last but not least, I want to talk about discharge. As I said earlier, if you're not comfortable going home, tell your nurse, okay? They're going to be there for you. You want to make sure that you've received all of your training that you're comfortable with. You want to know who you can call if you have to answer questions or ask questions that you forgot to during discharge. Um, and then there's prepping for it, which hopefully you'll have a, a case manager who can walk you through that process, notifying your home nursing agency to make sure you have care lined up if you have one, uh, making sure that you have all the equipment that you need if they've had, uh, if you need adjustments due to some kind of new bracing system or again, healing wounds. Um, do you have enough supplies? Most nurses will give you a giant stash of supplies kind of on the down low. So feel free to ask. Prescriptions, referrals, um, again, they should be all lined up, but it doesn't hurt to double check. And last but not least, if you bring in home meds, make sure you bring them out because they won't ship them to you. <laughs> had that happen to me once, had to travel an hour to go get it the same day that we had come home from discharge, which was not really something I wanted to do. So um, that is the hospital, short and sweet from the parents' point of view. If anyone has any questions, I think we're gonna be having a question and answer session at the end. And all of this will be available as well. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you so much, Heather. That was like so lovely and thorough. And thank you really helpful for so many of us in the season so on that note so we have this parent perspective of this time we have another parent who um dr courtney courtney horton and she works at children's national medical center and is a fox she one mom to gianna everyone thanks kate and heather that was really awesome amazing presentation um so as kate said I'm Courtney, my daughter is Gianna. She just turned four last week. She was diagnosed with FOXG1 in 2020 when we lived up in New York and now we live in Washington, DC. I am currently a second year resident at Children's National, uh, just doing my general peds residency right now. Um, my biggest research interest is on caregiver stress and mental health screening in the pediatric primary care setting. As maybe some of you can relate to, it seems like parents who have children with complex medical needs barely have time to take care of their own health, let alone mental health um, issues. And so I think there's a, a huge need that could potentially be addressed in the pediatric setting when you're taking your, your child. Um, so that's one of the research interests of mine. Um, so I don't have any slides. I'm just gonna just gonna talk today. And hopefully some of my time can be used for Q&A too, because I think um, it'd be helpful for me to hear what questions um, have come up for parents that have spent a lot of time on the, on the patient side of being in the hospital. Um, but for me to start out and maybe to address something that's maybe somewhat obvious, um, but has become more obvious to me since joining the a parent and patient community is how that there can often be a lot of distrust, disappointment, and kind of skepticism um, between families with children with special needs um, and the medical community, medical providers at large. Certainly not always the case. There are lots of examples of good experiences that, that people have, but I think at one time or another, I'm sure you've all come across an experience that you wish had gone another way. Um, and I think the reason for that can be somewhat clear. Um, families who come in with a lot, a lot of medical literacy and specific expertise caring for their child 
um, often don't feel like they're being heard or understood uh, by their doctors um, or by the doctors who they don't know at all, residents they don't know at all. Um, and those same doctors maybe haven't even seen FOX human before, heard of it before. Um, and so don't know the complete medical trajectory, medication trials, et cetera. Um, on top of that, many of the physicians, the residents you'll see are trainees. And so again, um, have a lot of patients and they all come with sort of medical complexity that I think is sometimes overwhelming from the provider standpoint. So because of that, there can be a lot of disappointment and, and sort of, as I mentioned, sort of unmet expectations um, during a hospitalization. Um, so that being said, I think I want to spend most of the time talking about a couple of things that that I thought of that I think would be helpful to think about going into the hospitalization during the time there, and then we'll open to to more questions, um, which would be helpful for me to know, you know, what what other things maybe I didn't address. Uh, so the first thing is not this is not always in your control. Often um, you have to go where the ambulance takes you if you call nine one one to bring your child to the hospital, but. If at all possible, if there's at all a chance that you can drive your child to the nearest children's hospital, that would be my first recommendation, trying to avoid adult specific hospitals, if at all possible, even if they have sort of a small, uh, maybe peds area. Um, the biggest reasons for that are that adult hospitals use adult lab reference values, which are not always helpful. There's a lot of wasted time transferring your child to the children's hospital. Um, and medications are not dosed to the same for adults and for children, as I'm sure you're familiar with. It's a much more weight-based dosing for kids. Um, so in general, if that's at all possible, that would be the first, first thought to try to skip the local hospitals if, if you can. Um, and then when you know, you're presenting the history of what's going on with your child and what's bringing you to the hospital now, um, it, I think it's super important to talk about what your child is typically like and to sort of offer that proactively because that doesn't always that those kind of questions don't always get elicited or until later on um, sometimes. So what your child is like normally, what they do normally, and what is different now um, to to give a provider who has never seen your child before that context for what is really scaring you or what's bringing you in. Uh, for this hospitalization, having a broader context helps them to put into perspective how serious or, you know, how to triage what's going on. Um, and then in terms of being in the hospital and being admitted, I'm sure, you know, we're, we're a small group, so I won't spend a lot of time on that, but I did want to kind of go over briefly the timeline of what, what, it, what a day um, inpatient looks like and why all of these people are knocking on your door at six in the morning. Um, so in general, when, if you go to a teaching hospital, which typically has residents, um, there's a period of time between roughly six and 8 a.m. Um, where residents pre-round. So they come to see you and your family um, uh, by themselves, do a physical exam to the extent possible, try, sometimes needing to wait the kid up and sometimes not, um, but just kind of a check-in to see how you're doing. Um, sometimes they wake you up to ask you if you have any questions. Um, and then de also depending on the hospital system, the doctors will sometimes round in what's called family-centered rounds, meaning they come back to the room with the whole team. So including all of the medical students, all of the doctors, um, the attending doctor, the pharmacist, the nurse, the charge nurse, um, and we'll spend time going over the plan, doing a physical exam as a group. So a lot of hospital systems have moved to a more family-centered approach. Sometimes that doesn't happen. Sometimes they round separately and kind of come and update you later on. Um, and for that reason, sometimes there are many visits from, you've got the resident coming in. Sometimes there's a fellow, if you're on a subspecialty team, that's coming in to see you and then the attending. So you get maybe a lot of visits. Um, in kind of in the, the morning time. Um, and usually that whole morning um, stretch is when the big plans for the day are gonna be made. So any big changes that are happening typically happen in the morning. So my, my biggest thought is to the extent that you can have all of your questions teed up for the morning, 
whether that's telling the medical student, the resident, the first person you see, the more likely it is that changes will happen that day and things will move forward. Um, the questions that filter in later through the afternoon and certainly through the evening often have covering providers that are reluctant to change the, pre the plan of the primary team. And so they, they will defer until the next day. So sometimes that means a full 24 hours before any change can be made. So um, I always recommend keeping lists throughout the day because it can be a lot of pressure when someone says, what questions do you have? And you're like, well, I know I had them, but can't think of them right now with you looking at me. So it's helpful to kind of make a list and, and be ready for as early as possible um, because then it gets incorporated in the, the resident presentation or the medical student presentation and sometimes moves forward the plan a, a little bit faster. Um, yeah, and um, then sort of in terms of general stay in the hospital, if there are things that you know are best practices for having your child examined or for, for something for your child to participate in, um, always offering those um, can be super helpful just to get the best outcome, the best exam. I know Gianna for one really hated the crinkly paper for a really long time. And so she would cry the second she was put on it. So we started doing like, she could sit on my lap or she'd sit on a coat or something. And then they were able to get a much better physical exam on her without screaming. So little things, if there are those specific to your child that are gonna make for a better physical exam, better experience um, can be helpful. Um, and then another thought is that um, when you come to the hospital for a more acute issue, respiratory illness, something like that, um, usually the providers are more inclined to take care of that acute issue that the child is there for and less often um, want to make chronic changes. So medication changes, calling, sometimes calling consults that they feel like could be better dealt with outpatient. Um, and there are obviously many reasons why you would want to talk to your whole medical team while you're there, while you're there. Um, sorry, the bird just hit my window. <laughs> um, but I think just managing the expectation for what can actually be accomplished in a hospitalization can be helpful so that there aren't, there isn't disappointment when car cardiology declines to come and see you because they want you to come outpatient or something, something like that. If you're not there for a cardiac issue. Um, as an example, not always, you know, it's not the perfect system. It's not the best system, but I, I think it comes up quite often. Um, and so just kind of managing the expectation for what can be accomplished and can be done when you're there for a more acute problem. Um, and then I think another big topic and, um, you know, again, is, is trying to avoid the label uh, or any kind of label. Um, I've seen many instances and, and this is, you know, a huge area for me that I care a lot about is that I see families being labeled and pat and like that, that label is passed on from resident to resident, provider to provider. Um, so, you know, I think it can, it can be a really good thing. I've seen it work in the family's interest. So, you know, it's providers saying like this family is, you know, very medically literate. They're very attuned. You know, you can really trust what this mom is telling you about her child at the moment. I've seen that work in the favor of the child. And I've also seen the difficult parent label um, where it makes the providers a little more hands-off. Like I don't have control of the plan here. Um, and they're, they're less interested. So to the extent that you can try to, you know, it's it's challenging. Um, there's no good answer. I don't agree with any of what happens. Um, and, and again, like it's a huge area that I care a lot about, um, but I see it happen every day. Um, so it's, it's there um, to the extent you can, you know, try to make friends with everyone um, and at least, you know, and, and for me, the part I care about are like, residents and providers taking that step to collaborate with families rather than the onus being on the family to, to sort of initiate that. But it is what it is. So um, kind of just just putting out the, the warning to try to avoid being labeled. Um, and 
think that's a really interesting perspective that I don't know that we would have ever gotten if not from the doctor on the inside, you know, because it's here, you know, parents think, you know, I'm letting them know what I know, you know, I'm, and, and, you know, to that could be turned into, well, she's going to make the decisions anyway, I'll stand back is exactly what we don't want. So that's, yeah, that's a really, really interesting point. So, yeah, thank you. Thank you, Courtney. And we're going to do our I'm sorry, But did you have another, I kind of interjected, but did you have another? Um, my, my last point was um, to be open to medical students being involved in um, your child's care. They can be great advocates as well because they sometimes have more time to spend in the room. Um, I think sometimes it's seen that like medical students are either in the way or, or whatever, but really they're just another voice advocating for your child. They have a lot to learn um, and they can, you know, they more often only have like one patient that they're following. So they can sometimes really follow up a lot more, come visit you more often, make sure your questions are getting answered and, and kind of funneled back to the team. Um, so contrary to what you might think, I think it's really helpful to have a medical student because it's like the most amount of time anyone is going to spend on your patient, your, your child's chart, because uh, they do like a lot of chart digging and that's their job. <laughs> so, um, yeah, to the extent that, that someone comes in, just kind of be open and, and friendly to the medical students. Yeah. And even for Fox G1 syndrome on that note, I have seen medical students become really interested in Fox G1 syndrome and follow us and stay connected to us and wind up becoming, you know, part of our team. So, you know, the medical students are absolutely such a incredible resource for us in the hospital. Um, and just one note also Heather made while you were speaking about the rounds is how um, parents can participate in, in the rounds. As you were saying, it's good for parents to know that. Yes, absolutely. That's the whole whole idea behind family centered rounds is to have parent input so that the plan doesn't get made and then presented to the family that it, you know there's not a shared decision making. It's the whole idea is a shared decision making model where the family, you know, agrees and buys into to the plan for the day so that we're everyone's on the same page for the best outcomes. So and it's also a good chance to, you know, because we're kind of playing the game of operator, right? This person wrote this notes, these notes, these notes, and then the parent is there saying, wait, wait, the message got, got messed up there. And that's where we have the opportunity to say, no, that's not the dose. And that's not the, you know, because we're probably listening the closest. Yep. And Heather just said a parent can remove a doctor from treatment. So that's that's an interesting parent insight. Um, but uh, thank you so much, Courtney. This is like a total different perspective than I've learned. So our third and final presenter, let me show her picture again before she begins to talk, wow. is Kayla Lyman. And she is a certified personal trainer of Hel uh, Helix Fitness for caregivers and a Fox G1 mom of Phineas. Hello, everyone. I'm Kayla. Um, as Kate said, I'm a certified personal trainer and um, I teach uh, fitness classes as well at a local gym. Um, I specifically became a personal trainer uh, for us. Um, I became well, first of all, I'll share about my son. My son is Phineas, he's eight. He was diagnosed um, uh, at uh, 16 months old. And um, yeah, it's been a wild ride as, as it has been for everybody. Um, I am a single mom of four. My kids are four, um, I'm sorry, I have four children. Their ages are eight, 10, 12, and 14. And Finn's my youngest. And I became a single mom in 2020. And I really wanted to take care of my mental health as being a single mom while having a child with severe medical needs. And in that process, knew that I really needed to take care of my physical health as part of my mental health, because those are very, very intertwined. Um, and I started my own journey of working out trying to become stronger, seeing the big picture of the long term of caring for Finn, my son, and saying, this is all on me. Um, I do 90% of this care myself. So 
I realized the importance of just being strong physically was a huge part of what my life plan for myself was going forward. Um, so I just was like, I will be strong. That's what's going to happen for me. Um, so I started taking um, my own health, which was already something that I was very interested in anyways. So I just started really revving that up and um, got really involved with fitness classes and rock climbing and things um, at a gym close to my house. And that really led me to realize that it was like a, a preventative care for myself. Um, it's when we build our muscles, um, it's like an armor for our bodies, which helps prevent injuries, um, which is something I'm going to talk about today. But um, about a year ago, I got certified as a personal trainer um, because personal training within the healthcare spectrum is consider considered um, preventative care. So what are we doing for ourselves um, as informal caregivers when we have children who have these needs. We have, I would say, a majority of us who have Fox G1 children or adults um, have, they have high physical needs. Um, and that directly affects our physical bodies as well. Um, as we all know, and nobody really needs to be told that, that's just how it works. Um, and so my whole vision, my passion, my um, my dream is to present um, a plan for those of us that are informal caregivers. Um, when you work in a hospital setting, if you're a nurse or a provider in some way, you're supposed to be provided with training. Um, how do you lift and transfer someone without hurting yourself? Um, how do you care for your own body in a way that's not going to give you back pain or shoulder pain? Um, and the list goes on. And um, I'm quite new to what I'm doing as I was uh, uh, working in a public school for a while as a teacher and switched careers specifically because um, I think we as caregivers would all say we're quite overlooked, right? Um, gosh, I don't know if any of you have heard of the documentary that's coming out about caregivers that um, I'm very excited about it because it's highlights so well, like, how overlooked we are as those of us who care for our loved ones in our home. Um, we're just so overlooked. Like no one's training us on how to do these things for ourselves. Um, so anyways, um, in my own trying to find research, trying to dig into medical journals and things, I have found there's an occupational therapist at Ohio State named um, Dr. Amy Dara. And she has specifically made her mission to study injuries for care, uh, caregiver injuries. And in a study that she has done, this was very recent, this was this year, um, they, they did about 50 informal caregivers who were caring for someone in their home. Um, and 94% of them over the course of a month reported, um, reported that they had some sort of musculoskeletal uh, pain. Um, who has had, because of the physical labor that you're doing for your, for your Fox G1 kid, um, who's had neck pain, back pain, or wrist pain, shoulder pain, knee pain, I'm going to bet it's pretty much everyone. Um, and in that, I'm trying to find a way that provides us with proper resources um, and that provides us with a way that we feel like we can be equipped with the information that we need to care for ourselves. Um, and I think there's been so much effort towards like our mental health. Like we need that so much. Um, there's just so many pieces to the puzzle of us as caregivers feeling like, uh, you know, we are well attended to as we are caring for this person in our life that we love dearly. And I think, um, you know, as caregivers, we have a hard time putting ourselves first. We have such a hard time saying like, I'm allowed to care for me and that's not selfish. Um, so I would say, um, you know, there's, there's a lot of, there's so many aspects that go into caring for ourselves um, physically that also lends itself to caring for ourselves mentally. And everything is that trickle down effect. When we are caring for ourselves, 
And we're allowing ourselves to do that without feeling selfish, um, taking that, that weight off of ourselves that we're allowed to do these things for ourselves too. Um, that drastically affects the person we're caring for. Um, and what I have found in my own workout and strength training and um, building up my own, not just muscle, but confidence in myself, um, you know, there's, there's many aspects of like, I am able to provide a more safe environment for my son. I don't know how many of your kids have Korea or dystonia, but Finn just throws himself backwards sometimes. And I'm catching him midair. I'm sure a lot of our kids do this. Um, you know, they're moving, they're unpredictable. We're not lifting like a box when you move off the floor. Um, lift with your knees, not your back. But what do you do when that's a person that's like flailing their body, right? Um, so I just uh, I really, really want to encourage and inspire all of us to know that what we do for our, ourselves in a physical way is directly affecting our, our children and providing them with an opportunity to have a safe environment um, as, well as, as well as us being able to take care of ourselves in a way that um, it benefits you and it benefits them. And at the end of the day, like that's what our kids need. They need us to be as stable as possible for ourselves first, where we can't really show up for them. Um, things long-term that I have seen are um, rotator cuff injuries, um, degenerative disc disease, um, severe back injuries that last long-term. Uh, and these are preventable things, as long as we are doing our part to care for ourselves. Um, there's so, so, so many things that we can do that will be able to, um, you know, prevent, prevent those injuries with, uh, mobility and other things that we can do that are not, they're not all, uh, super intense. We're not doing like CrossFit barbell type workouts. Um, but at the same time, I think I just want to, I really, really want to inspire and encourage people to go take care of your, of yourself and your own physical health. Um, yeah, I think that's about sums it up. That's amazing. I have one question. Um, if you, and I know this is hard because everybody's different. So you right. work individual with people, but if there were like one or three things that we can all take away to start doing to, you know, to incorporate into our life? Sure. What are the first things you think of? Yeah. Um, so when we think about movement, um, I, I would say, you know, our bodies are built to move. The human body is made for movement. Uh, we all know that if we become sedentary, our bodies really start to deteriorate. Um, so if that's true, and we know that, what are ways that we can move our bodies in a way that's enjoyable? What do you like to do? Um, if you're like doing this workout, sounds terrible, I don't wanna do that. Well, what do you like to do? Do you like to go on walks? Do you like to run? Do you like to kayak? Like the world of movement is huge. And I think limiting it to just cert certain things, like let's think bigger and how are we gonna be able to move ourselves in a way that is gonna benefit ourselves? Um, the second thing is, I think that culture, um, the fitness world and the way that our culture is around dieting, uh, diet fads, all this stuff has really sucked the life out of us. And I really love focusing on what are we adding, not what are we losing? Um, putting so much emphasis on like, oh, I just gotta lose weight. Well, how about what are we adding? Like throw away your scale. Some, sometimes keeping up with weight is important, but that's a whole nother talk. Um, what I would emphasize is what are you adding to your life, not what are you taking away? I'm adding strength, I'm adding stability, I'm uh, increasing my mental health, I am creating a more safe environment for my child, I am making my, my mood is better because I have natural endorphins being released. Um, adding, not taking away. Um, the third thing would be, I mean, sleep. <laughs> Who, which, who of us has not struggled with massive uh, sleep deprivation? And I think that's a really tricky one for another day, as well as far as like, how do you program, how do you work out when you're running on three hours of sleep or something? Like, I've been there. We trialed 11 sleep medications before we found one that worked. Like, I get this very much. Um, 
but you know when we move our bodies that also equals better sleep um and i don't know who of us doesn't want that so yeah especially when we're in the hospital too with the sleep component is right. hard when we're in the hospital yeah this was yeah so helpful so important for fox one parents to think about as far as you know every every human being should be thinking about their health but for us i love the angle of you know don't just think about for ourselves but for our children it's so important to be strong and be healthy i can i can i'm signed up with kayla i'm one of her current participants and i'm just started like about two weeks ago and it's been wonderful for me and we've set like realistic goals that i can start from coming off from like the couch literally so um like and just being aware of like so i noticed i pick up my son on the same shoulder and so i feel like i'm imbalanced and being aware of that and she picks these amazing per workouts with informative videos and it's like helps me do things that i I guess I just never tried because I, I don't know, it, it takes, it takes having somebody help support you to try new things sometimes. So I'm really appreciative of, of trying it out. So if anyone else, this is curious, this is Kayla's new business um, and contact info. And I think that's, is this the link? This is the link to that caregiver injury article you referenced. Right. If you want to read the whole article, um... The article itself, I find amazing. Um, that link is, is there. My website is in the slide as well. If anyone's interested in reaching out to me about any questions as well, like beyond today, if you want to look into what programs I offer, um, reach out to me on my website. Um, you know, on behalf of all Fox One parents and all um, parents of children with disabilities, is thank you for, you know, doing this, you know, for the focus being on us. Because, you know, especially, I mean, Heather, how, how much does Jacob weigh now? 150. Wow. Gosh. How do you do it? <laughs> with a ceiling <laughs> lift. Yeah, but even a lot of things. log rolls. A lot of. <laughs> I remember you were the first person to tell me. I was like, "How did how to turn Josie over when she started getting big?" I was like, "I don't know what to do." Log roll. Log roll. Log yeah. roll. Beautiful thing. Yeah, but you know, I I just um. I can tell uh, you personally in terms of injuries. I just finished a round of PT for my neck, and now I'm going into a round of PT for my back. And now I've got to have my shoulders checked out because the PT didn't help that. So, you know, it's, it is, it's hard, it's so hard on your body. So I am super excited, Kayla, that you're putting this together. It's going to benefit so many people. Yeah. It's yeah. wild that it's not been, someone else hasn't done it. I yeah. find that really sad. I'm like, why me? Weird. We're all given this, this role that we realize yep. we can't can offer and as a community foundation how could we take all these you know skill sets we each have and make sure that our entire community has these um resources so that's mm -hmm. what we're here to do together actually Lori has a question and Lori, i'm gonna click allow to talk uh let's see uh there you are um hello hi Lori. hey I just had a question about um, speaking to the social worker whenever you're in the hospital. Um, I know we talked about like there are grants and things available that we don't really know about until we ask. Like, what specifically do you ask the social worker when you get there? Um, I have told them that. So I don't want to say a sob story, but I'm pretty frank with them. Um, are there any funds available? My husband has to take time off so that he can stay home with our other child who has needs as well and can't be left alone. He's going to be missing work. He's out of time off. I'm clearly here. Is there anything available that can help us with these financial constraints? You know, I just explained the situation very matter of fact, not necessarily trying to 
get anything out of them, but just to ask the question. It doesn't hurt. When Jacob was in the hospital for 24 days, he was in the PICU once, um, we ended up finding out about one particular fund that gives uh, for life-threatening experiences um, $5,000. Was so we were able to apply to that and um, get that. And that took care of our bills for like, you know, our mortgage for at least two months, three months. So we had that to fall back on while my husband was out of work because I was with Jacob. That's amazing. That's yeah. you know, being resourceful, asking if you don't ask, the, but the answer is always no, right? Exactly. Um, that's that's and was that grant a local to Massachusetts or that particular no member? no it was called Bridget's Brigade I think well I've heard of that mm -hmm. so yeah these resources and you know and as I was saying you know continuing to grow our resources on the website so that parents have like a list of potential grants to help you when you're out of work because you're in the hospital. So, you know, the more, um, it was such a fantastic conversation and such great advice, you know, and I've, I've, we've all been through it, you know, too many times and to learn something from each other every time is, you know, what this community is all about.